back to it. Are we ready to get back to it? Now that we've learned the basics of interactive remote execution, we can actually talk about doing things in parallel, what we came here to do. So we talked earlier about the way you interact with IPython Parallel. You create a client, and then you create views on that client. And the simple way to create what are called direct views, a direct view you can think of as an engine multiplexer. So I've got, I've got one engine I call fly. Um, I can have n engines. So E0, this is how I created my, my engine 0 before. I can get all my engines. I can get my engines with even indices by slicing with a stride of two. I can get my odd engines with slicing uh, with stride of two and an offset of one. And I'm going to, the view I'm going to use is all engines, and I'm going to start out synchronous. So just in all my views, I'm going to just get the PID. I'm going to call, I'm going to apply os.getPID on all my views and see what happens. So when I've got a view on engine zero, I get the return value as an integer. It's the PID on engine zero. When I call it on all my engines, I get a list. I get a list of four PIDs. When I call it on my in even engines, I get a list of two PIDs. When I call it on my odd engines, I get a list of, um, of the other two PIDs. Um, and the important thing is each of these has a target's attribute. And the return value of apply on a direct view is always the same shape as the targets. So if I did a direct view, which only has one engine, but that is a list of length one. So you note that my E0, its targets is an integer. If I create a list of length one, oh, there's an easier way to do that. I get a list of length one. So it's not if there's one engine. There's a difference between a, sing there's a special difference between a single engine view and a, a a direct view with with um, with a list of engines, a list of targets. And just like push, what? A, a grid, uh, you, there has been some discussion of doing kind of grid arrays. Of, it's, uh, it, it's not supported at this point. We could, we could certainly do that. But yeah, we haven't. I don't think anybody. Yeah, it's it's a list. It right now it's a it's a one D list. It's a list of integers, it, actually, it's specifically a list of integers, not a list of lists of integers or anything. It is. Yeah. It's think one. If we end up going in that direction, I would like to think in the future more than a list, uh, a, a grid, actually allow you to express the connectivity, the topology of that connectivity, and then the, the, the underlying data structure that you might get in a case like that might be some kind of graph object so that you can represent you, the topology you're interested in. Because when you do that, you're really thinking about communication as well as what you're after. You're talking about having a, a, list, a, a separate list for each host of all those properties. I will get to, I, yeah, I will get to something like that. Yeah, so a logical reason, it doesn't, unless it's just you're doing some naive load balancing or something, it, it doesn't make, necessarily make that much sense, sense to just give me my even engines. But it does make sense to say, give me a view on all my engines on this host. And I will, in fact, do exactly that later in order to do efficient data movement, to move data to a machine exactly once, or once per machine. So in addition to push and pull, direct views have scatter and gather. And these are just, instead of pushing the objects everywhere, you push, you partition the object and push. So A, I take range 16 and I split it up into chunks and that everybody has, all my engines have a sub list and then I can gather it and that just takes the lists back and reassembles it. 
and the scatter and gather functionality. Um, uh, the scatter and gather, gather functionality lets you um, easily partition and distribute uh, data structures. It, it supports basic iterables and also uh, special partitioning for NumPy arrays. Um, and it, the machinery there is actually pluggable, so you can write your own partitioning for your own object classes. You're on Python 3. Yeah, just call list on range. Yeah, sc scatter, I guess one, you could argue that scatter on, an, on any iterable should work. Map on most iterables does work. Um, scatter, I guess it could. Yeah. Yeah, no, on, on, yeah. Yeah, pass iterables through list. Um, it does need to know the length in order to do the partitioning, so it does need to get through all of it. Um, yeah. No, no, it, it's, it literally is take, the, take a, the iterable, take the iterable, get the length of it, get the number of engines, and then give me a slice, send, and then do, actually do push. And give me another slice and actually do push. No, I don't remember. I, th I think if it's unevenly partitioned, you end up with the last guy getting, I think, I don't remember. They're, they're a variety. Oh, good point. Yeah. Let's learn by doing. I think it just gets the extras. Yeah. Oh. It, okay, so it, yeah, so you get, it's the opposite of, Rather than the last one getting the remainder, the last one is the short one. So you get, uh, you, I guess that's better load balancing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is a better thing to do. I makes sense. <laughs> right. Um, so often you want that. You may want to do. As, as is common in MPI programming, you'll have logic that switches based on the MPI rank of the engine. And with IPython, we don't actually start the engine namespace with anything in it. So if you want the engines to know their IDs, you actually have to send them. Um, but if you use scatter, then everybody has a list of length one with their own ID. And that's not super useful. So there's this flatten argument that says if somebody would get uh, a single item, unpack it, to the item itself rather than a list with, of length one. So this is, this is a particularly uh, common pattern for getting things started. If you want to do different logic on different engines, you, you scatter the IDs with flatten equals true, and then you can start doing switches for this engine should do this, that engine should do that. So I'll just create a couple of rays, an M by N and an N by M. So 16 by 4 and 4 by 16, and then I'll scatter them both. And scattering, by default, um, operates, I think, well, by default, I think only uh, uh, operates on, on, on one axis. So if I scatter uh, the tall, skinny array, I get little squares. And if I scatter the uh, wide, short array, <laughs> um, I, get, I get one row per, uh, per, per engine. No, uh, that's what we just uh, viewed up here. If I did range 18, that's not evenly divisible. So this guy got five. Three guys got five, and one guy got, or two got five, two got four. So it will, it will do the same thing. So now that I've got a couple of matrices that are appropriately shaped, here's an, an exercise for can you write um, uh, a matrix multiply that uh, distributes the computational workload. I promise this will be about as inefficient a way to write matrix multiply as you can imagine, but um, that it at least uh, distributes the computational work given two arrays. So I want to do, 
I'm going to do C equals A dot B um, by distribute, distribute the arrays appropriately, do sub work, um, and then pull it back. For people who might be rusty on their matrix math, um, the dot product of the left array and a subarray, and the dot product of the left array and a row of the right array is the row of, will be, will correspond to the, to the row of the resulting matrix. emphasize you're not going for performance here. <coughs> yeah, I, I took two, CS267. I know how to make matrix multiply fast. This is not how you do it. Uh, when I took it, it was Jim Demel and Kathy Allen Fuller. Work together. Consult your neighbors. Yeah. Someone you, don't need, you don't need to silently stare at your screen all alone. You have friends to your left and right. Well, most of you do. <coughs> the uh, yeah, second hint is you're going to want to make one call to push, another call to scatter, and then you're going to execute, and then you're going to gather something. First bit follows. You do not scatter both matrices. You will scatter one and push the other. Anybody still working on that? Yep. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, linear algebra. Um, so if you, <laughs> the, the, in C equals A dot B, um, the first row of C is the dot product of A, all of A, So basically, if the, the easiest way to... If A is split in half and B is split in half, you don't have enough information to yep. compute the full dot product. Yeah, so for each element in the result, you need all of a column of one and all, and all of a row of the other. And so the easiest way to do that... Um, so you, you could do that by partitioning it up into a bunch of chunks and doing, computing the little sub-matrices and doing complex sums. But the simplest way is, as I will show you, I move the solution. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I reorganized my notebooks a little bit. Uh, so here we are pushing the entirety of, of B everywhere. We are scattering A, so everybody gets a little chunk of A. And then we are assigning C to the dot product of all of the subset of A and all of B, 
and we're just gathering those submatrices, which are the complete dot product of a subset of the final result, and gathering the results back. So the reference to make sure I'm actually doing it right is I just call the dot product group locally, and then I call my, my p dot with a view and my two matrices. I got the right answer. Um, yeah, so Fernando had a, had a good point. So if you if you're following along and you want to do exercises and things, it it might be better to shift enter along, so that you're executing the code as you go rather than just scrolling down. And then you might get name errors for things that are defined above that you didn't execute through. Um, Where are their print statements? Oh, here's one. I updated some of them. I guess I haven't updated all of them. But add parentheses, it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've, I haven't, I've updated most of them, but I think there's still some. Uh, you could use it on a cell by cell basis, but I've, honestly, the changes are small enough that getting two or three to work on notebooks would be more work than just actually adding parentheses. Result rather than returning an async result. And the gathers are gathering on the same one as what the P Yes, it's always in the same. So the, the targets is that list. Um, the elements of the result are always in the same place. So if you've got targets equals 3, 4, 5, 2, 1, the results will be the result from engine 3, then engine 4, then 5, then 2, then 1. Okay. It's blocked. Uh, so they, the order is still preserved, yeah. uh, even in async. Um, the async map result, which we'll get to on the next notebook, can, uh, so by default, the order is preserved under all circumstances, but there is a certain situation where you're doing load balance execution, and you can explicitly say ordered equals false, and then it will yield results as they arrive, rather than um, in the order in which they are executed. Right, because unordered by default would surprise a lot of people. <laughs> and we, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so we got our peanut. So now map. Remember, we talked about we had we had a uh, map on on our on our views. So just like we've got map um, in the built-ins, we've got map the method, and we can. Do an async map with 32 things, and it's still in. So the message IDs corresponds to how many messages did I actually send, and how many kind of discrete execution units did I assign to my engine. And this will be so, and you'll see that this is four. No matter what the size of the iterable, I actually partitioned it into four chunks, sent one chunk to each engine, and then that actually called the built-in map locally, and then built lists, and then I got back four lists, and I joined them back. Map is scatter, apply, gather, basically. Does that make sense? Actually, it, it, map is, in fact, scatter, apply, map, gather. Did, did people understand what I said when I said apply map? So it's, it's like um, I did uh, dvu.scatter arg range 32. And then, yes. Uh, Execute the result, sub result. Mm. Eh, foo. And then, 
something like that. That's, that's the logic of what map does. So going back to the, the uh, psychic image example, I used my direct view to kind of set up my engines. What that means is PX, so PX is a magic that's based, it's a shortcut for execute. So PX um, is a shortcut for just for view dot, uh, view dot execute with a string. So it lets me not type execute in parentheses. And then you can, so by def, yes, yeah, so it registers a magic. Um, there is a method on view, even, uh, let's do E0. Um, there's an activate method. And it takes a, a suffix. So now I can do px0. And that ran on engine zero. Um, and when you create a client, it creates a view on all engines and activates that with no suffix. So px starts out hooked up to um, to all to a direct view on all engines. But you can actually you can change that by doing um, even dot activate. And if you pass it no arguments, it clobbers um, the existing. Make sure I've put it back where I was. Yeah, so you can, so you can register any number of PX magics for any subset, any any direct view. This is just using some IPython shell ex expansion magic for making sure all my engines have the same working directory as my notebook, so the paths work out. <laughs> and then on all engines, execute this code that's set up matplotlib to use ag. Import matplotlib, import scikit image. And then I want to push. Um, so I got these functions that this is just, I, I got the functions out of the original notebook. Push these functions so they're defined. And then call the get contours on one. Right, so I'm setting up my engines with the direct view. I'm saying everybody import, um, do the import so your namespace is all set up, define variables, configure matplotlib, and then push, say everybody needs these utility functions. And then locally, I can call engines.map, and then I'm gonna give it one engine per, or one image per engine and then I'm going to iterate through that result. Wait interactive is this printing thing. It's saying for an async result, it just every second it says this many, ta I ha I have this many tasks out of this many total are done and the current elapsed time. And the, the attributes it uses are um, amr.progress. Uh, this is the number it's done, amr.total. I think len amr is the, the second number, and then amr.elapsed is the, the time that's used on that. And you can, you can always query these for tasks that are done or not done. So there are my, my figures that I got that <coughs> arrived as they were finished. So we can look at a, an, oops, let's actually do it in the right place. Ah. Oops. Yeah, so 
The exercise is in exercises and remote iteration. So this is this is an, an exercise. This is these parts aren't very interesting. Um, I want you to get to write a function given a view and a, a name of an iterable in that views interactive namespace that returns an iterator on the actual values in that remote list and then in that remote iterable. Does anybody, does, um, do people know what I mean by that? So I can, I can iterate, so if I've got uh, foo equals, uh, this will work on Python 3. Um, So this is a writing a generator that yields um, things in in a container. And when you call next on it, you get another element. And when you get to the end, oh, there's you'll get it'll raise a special stop iteration. So a relevant side for this is if you're trying to catch a, uh, an exception. Um, so this is code that will raise a name error. You can't directly catch a name error because it will actually raise something else. What it will raise is a remote exception which has a name, a value, uh, the, the message and a traceback. So I can write this function that will execute and then catch a remote error. And if it's a name error, it will re-raise it as a proper name error. So this is a function that I can call and catch, actually catch name errors. So you can see I called, when I did the assignment above, I tried to catch the name error, but didn't. And then by wrapping remote error and turning it back into a name error, I can catch the name error. So if you want to fill out the remote iterator, which should be a generator that gets an item off of an iterable, but that iterable needs to stay on the engine. Yes, one item at a time. If you want to chunk it differently, that's fine. But, okay, the, the simple way would be to pull and then return the thing, but that's cheating. Here is a, a hint for doing an unreasonably verbose iterator around an object, but that should have kind of the missing pieces that you want to turn into remote operations, all explicitly filled out. with eval, or you can use, you might want a parallel reference there. You can get an iterator on a thing by calling iter. Oh, 
that won't work in Python 3. But that. Yeah. So there's an images notebook. It's linked from the, the uh, image address. <laughs> but if, you, if there are any <coughs> images on your computer, you can use those uh, just by setting the like pictures path to a directory that has pictures. And then I can catch stop iteration and then raise stop iteration. That will be something we'll want similar to that. I'm interested in the interested in the solution? Anybody still working on it? No? Nobody's working on it? Alright. So the solution for this remote iter iterator, we have the name, so I just execute, here is a variable and it is an iterator on that container. I create a parallel reference on the iterator and then while true, I yield, um, this is the Python 3 version. I yield the next item in that iterator. And then I catch a remote stop iteration and raise a real one. Because otherwise I would get an exception. I would get, a, if I tried to iterate through this when the remote iterator um, hit stop iteration, I would raise a remote exception which the regular iteration logic in um, Python would not catch. In an ever so slightly fancier version uses a reference to the next method on the iterator. This actually won't work on Python 3 because they, they removed next methods. Um, but I can just call apply with the reference to the next method. Yeah? Is there a fake You can use view IDs or whatever. Yeah. Or if, you're, if you know you're the only one using it, you can just use foo. Yeah, it depends on the nature of your, of how the cluster is being used. And one thing that's, you wouldn't, if you've got a big compute cluster and a hundred users, you wouldn't say IP cluster start once and then all your users connect to the same queues and engines and everything. You would start one IP cluster per like PBS job. And you bring up one cluster, you use it for a while, and then you're done with the simulation, you bring it down. So generally there's only one user and only, a, only one to a few clients operating on that at a time. So you can, it's generally safe to make assumptions about the state of the namespace under, nor, under normal circumstances. So everybody's got, uh, everybody's got data. I can create remote iterators on, on all my engines. For each iterator, if I call list on those iterators, it's actually. So my iterators are generators. And then I iterate through my iterators and cast them to lists, which actually does the iteration. And I get things and I can use this by um, actually just passing the remote iterators to heapq.sort and it's going to do local sorting of remote data. So I can talk about load balance execution. So you've got, uh, now we've figured out how to run on my engines, I want engine zero to do this, so I want everybody to do that. You can also load balance by creating a different kind of view. Remember, the, if you wanted an execution model, that execution model corresponds to a view. So a load balanced view is actually the same, it, it operates really the same as the single engine view, it's just you don't know what engine it is and it's a different one every time. So right, I can apply sync on E0, I can also apply sync on LView. It's the same thing. But what's different 
is E0, apply sync with the PID, gives me one result. I can do it a bunch of times, gives me the same result. If I do apply sync with PID on the load balance view, I get a different PID every time. Because I'm entrusting IPython to pick which engine to run on. I'm telling IPython I don't actually care. Just like uh, the direct view, the load balance view has a map. But unlike the direct view, when you call map on a load balance view, it, uh, its default behavior is to send one element of the sequence as a task. Because right, you don't, you don't, IPython doesn't know if your function is going to take 10 minutes per element or um, 10 nanoseconds. So it says, all right, I'm going to assume maximum load balancing. I'm going to create a message for every item in the sequence and then assign each one one at a time to all my entries. And map results are iterable. Oh, and, and you can use chunk size to control that. So rather than if I set chunk size of four, it says rather than sending one element as a message to each engine, send four elements at a time. Right, and the, the, the way the direct view works is it just automatically picks the chunk size so that the work is evenly, uh, evenly distributed. But you may use, your function may vary wildly in terms of what the arguments are, how long they'll take. So the load balance view lets you say, uh, rather than pre-assigning all the work and balancing the number of function calls to make, it can do the load balancing as execution happens. So if you've got a couple of fast functions, they'll be appropriately run on the same machine. An important part of the asynchronous nature of, of IPython, um, map results are asynchronous, are, you can iterate through a map result and you'll get results as they arrive. You see, I'm just, uh, I'm creating an async result that is just view.apply. And that's not going to finish for three seconds or so, but I can iterate through it and I get the results right away. So I'm iterating through it um, before the total computation represented by that async result is, is done. And I can do the same thing with um, async map result. That was unreasonably fast. You can look at the wall time of that. Let's make it a little bit longer. So basically every second I'm going to get four chunks done. You can look at how long it took. Um, so some instrumentation for async results to look at the computation. Um, the Elapsed time is the time since the task, the work was submitted, um, which is available even when the work isn't done. The wall time is the time from when the work was submitted to when the work arrived at the client. The serial time is the sum. So there are four timestamps. There's when it leaves the client, arrives at the kernel, leaves the kernel, and arrives back at the client. The serial time is the sum of all the time the engine spent working on it. So in theory, if, if you did things all locally in order, um, the serial time is how long that would, that would have taken. And the wall time is the how long it actually did. So these are, these are the useful values for, is it, am I spending my time reasonably by doing this in parallel, which the, the answer is often no. Um, it is, it is it is extremely easy to write uh, parallel code that is slower than serial code. Right, and here's an example of running a bunch of work on different engines. And you'll see that they are being assigned in a round robin fashion to all my engines. And then we can you know, look at how long it took, how long it would have taken. Roughly four is roughly the number of engines. Um, if you add a chunk size to map, you can see each engine's getting a block of tasks at a time. Block of four tasks. Let's 
So here's an, another exercise um, to look at. This is a common um, model that you have is you've got nested for loops. You've got for A in collection one, for B in collection one, call a function with A and B. If you want um, to load balance that easily, the easiest way to load balance is with map, but you need to do some manipulation of the arguments in order for them to be appropriate uh, for map, because map doesn't take, you know, doesn't take nested um, iterators. It takes just one list for each argument. So the exercise here is, can you turn this nested for loop into a call to map, a single call to map with an async result? Yeah, there are tools. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute and then I'll, I'll show you there. There are a couple tools in, actually I'll just show you right now. Um, <laughs> there are tools in Python um, for dealing with multiple iterators or multiple iterables. And those are iterTools.product, which gives you the Cartesian product of, of two arrays, and, uh, and zip will also be useful. tools.product. Useful doc strings for completing this. This is not, this doesn't necessarily help you use IPython, but, uh, or it's not really relevant to IPython, but in a remarkable number of actual research projects involving uh, that it, we've done with IPython Parallel have ultimately reduced to wanting to turn a nested for loop into a call to map. And so these, these come up all the time. So having this in your, in your mental toolbox will be, will be useful if you're doing any kind of parallel stuff. our solution, so we can create a product. I don't need that. So we need to call map with A and B, and the Cartesian product of, of widths and heights is a list of tuples, which are the A and B I want. Right, so I want, I want to call area with one and six, I want to call area with one and seven, and with two and six, two and seven, et cetera. But that's not the structure that, um, that map wants. Map wants a list of all my A's and a list of all my B's. And that's exactly what zip does. Zip lets you, um, t uh, zip basically does a transpose of a list of tuples. So here I have my widths in order, one, 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 two, 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 and my heights in order. And you'll notice that they, they cycle differently, so they're they're in the in the right shape for my nested for loop. And then my parallel areas are in fact the same. So I, that tells me that I even when I did this, I even iterated in the same order. <laughs> I didn't do it backwards or anything like that. Yeah, built-in map does the same thing. Divided map.
I'm going to go an example and can't really have a parallel computing tutorial without counting words. So we're going to I skipped that one. It's in here, but I skipped it. If you really want to do a Monte Carlo approximation of pi, we can go back to that. But yeah, so we're going to start at the top are just some utility functions for getting words. And then a function for creating a dictionary of the counts of those words. Simple enough. And it, it also does you know, phrases of various lengths. And so this, this function will download uh, Da Vinci's notebook from Project Gutenberg, if you don't already have it. Um, and then a simple utility function for looking at the, for just summarizing the results of, of uh, summarizing the, the dictionary that's the result of this. You can see the most common words in Da Vinci's notebook, light, eye, same, shadow, body. Yeah. Excluding, excluding the common words. Yeah, so, you know, we've got, we've got our simple function for counting words. If you want to do it in parallel, we can split the file. We could just do this with read offsets, but whatever. Um, so we'll split the, the file. So now we've got 10, 10 files that each contain a piece of, of, of the text. Weird underscores. Uh, so counts is just, it's a dictionary of word and number. So for every item, each item is a key, and then the, num the value for that key is the number of times that that word appeared in the text. <laughs> yes, I'm sure those underscores are original. Um, I think, oh, it's because underscore is a word character. That's me failing at regular expressions is what that is. Um, that's usually the case. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got this list of files. So now what I want you guys to do, if you want, or I can just do it. If nobody wants to do this, I can just do it and show you. Who would prefer me to just do it? All right. Does anybody want me to let you do it? <laughs> okay. I will. Um, they can build character, and everybody else can consider it a break. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm gonna populate the namespace, so you don't have to worry about that. And then I want you to write ngrams parallel, which takes a view and a list of function names or file names. Sorry and then n, the argument that's passed to n-grams. And then you will distribute the work of computing the sub-counts, and, the, and then you'll have to aggregate the results back into a single dictionary. Does that make sense? So you're going to partition, so the files are already, the data is already partitioned. You've got these file names that contain a subset of the data. And then you're going to want to compute subsets of the results Get the results back, and then with the with the results, you're going to need you're going to end up with multiple counts. You're going to need to merge those dictionaries so that you get um, you get a single single dictionary with all the counts. So if if this really were map reduce, this that would be the reduce step, but it's not.
hours of people who are actually working on it doing. Okay, confused? Questions? <laughs> on the right track? Yes? How do you debug the function? Well, you magic debug. That's right, I, I can show you, you can, um, depending, so the function you're calling in parallel, so I don't actually want you to write the function that you're calling in parallel, that function's already written. I want, yes. Yes, okay, so let's, let me uh, do this, let's, do this wrong. So, view dot map async. Um, what do I do something? Like oh, I haven't actually. Did I actually define my function? I did. Yeah. Diagrams. Where did they go? Where did they go? Diagrams. That's what I get for having startup files. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you shouldn't. It's it's a bad thing to do. And I. Uh, no, I have a lot more than 13 profiles. Um, 13, uh, 13 is a profile for debugging up, I think. Oh, no, 13. Yeah, so I do this <laughs> at startup every time. The main thing is this. That's the, that's the only thing that actually has a bearing on, well, that one and this one. That that's those are the things that cause me to write incorrect notebooks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do something wrong so that I can. So well, first I'll start it not as a function. And grams, let's do. So there I create an async map result and I called the, I called my function wrong, right? So now I want to see what, all right, give me the results. I got errors because of bad file descriptors. That's, that's really useful. Um, but that's, that's, these are the errors that actually raised remotely. And that's, No such file, that's a more informative error. So the reason is because if I look at n-grams, it takes file name and then n. Oops, I got those backwards. So now I do it right. Um, and where did it get? This might be really long. I don't want him. I want one. But I think the, the question is more like if you don't write, like there you are. Yeah, so it's the, the issue is, you know, if I've got, let's say, class doesn't do anything when I give it a string. I want it to raise an exception. Um, so if you do, if you do amr.get and the remote function raises an exception, If I get an IO error, that's, so, when you ask for the result and the remote function call failed, you actually get, you get what's called a remote error that is a wrapper for 
the, the error that raised on the engine, um, which is why. So I get two errors. Engine two failed with doesn't exist, doesn't exist, and engine one failed with also doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, and so at asking for results, um, we'll, we'll show you the tracebacks, and, and you, can you can actually hook up the percent debug and run that on engines if you, if you, want, if you want to. But yeah, I, I'll, show, I'll show you how to do that in a second. load my solution. So I just map async. So I get an async result object. I create accounts dictionary. And then I iterate through the async result object. And that will give me each engine count is itself accounts dictionary. So then I iterate through that counts dictionary. And if it's an item, a word or phrase not found in my dictionary, I start the number at zero, and then I add that dictionary. So that way if I have got, if, I, if engine zero gives me, you know, the number of times foo was found is 10, and engine two gives me, I found foo 20 times, I will get the sum of those, and in my resulting dictionary, I will get foo is 10 plus 20 is 30. Does that make sense? Now I get the three grams, so the most popular three-word phrase in DaVinci's notebook is light and shade. Hmm? Not the most popular is Leonardo da Vinci. It's up there, though. And so running the same kind of thing, getting some, some data from Project Gutenberg. I get this data from NLTK because when I wrote the script to scrape Project Gutenberg, I got forbidden from downloading from Project Gutenberg. <laughs> yeah, um, so don't do that. That is forbidden. Uh, but this will give you a, a few sample files, and I'll just unzip them. And then I can run, I can run this P counts with three grams on this set of books. Ex I exclude the Bible because the Bible is uh, like is longer than the rest of the books combined, so it dominates all the results. <laughs> I can run this, and then just as results arrive, I'll, I'll get my uh, counts of a great deal. It, it, clearly, <laughs> Moby Dick says the sperm whale a lot, but also the white whale. And then four grant. For grams, there are certainly some very polite people in these books. <laughs> yes, it's different. All right. Okay. And so that's the gist of you know sort of the basics of I've got some work. I want to partition my data. I want, to, I want to distribute the work on that data. We can use our, load, our direct view and our load balance together. This is how most things happen. Most work that I see actually works this way. So we've got all our pieces. We've got a direct view in all my engines and a load balance view. And then percent percent PX, this is run everywhere. So everywhere, I define, I import matplotlib, I get I define some functions to load data. I define some variables everywhere. Locally, I define my stock ticker. And then I define locally, again, a function to get um, some, get the relative, uh, the percent change year over year for a given stock name. And then I submit it by just doing load balance view dot map. Get an async map result. And then I can do uh, a matplotlib bar plot with actually passing the async map result object itself, not wrapping it in a list, not turning it into anything else, just pass, actually plotting the uh, async map result. And so these are, this, this demo can turn out very differently <laughs> depending on the time of year. There are actually no negatives.
Last, last year, there was a big negative on RIM, but now you get a 404 when you try to get stock data on RIM because they don't exist anymore. So we, we com what we just did was we set up the namespace, we generated some numbers in parallel, and we gathered them together, and then we plotted them locally. What we're about to do is actually generate the plots in parallel. So on all my engines, I set up, I select the inline matplotlib, load some pandas utilities, and I've got my plot, uh, plot a couple of years of, of Goog. And then I set up my namespace remotely. I scatter the ticker, so everybody's got a little sub ticker. Right, everybody's got a sub ticker. I push my plot stock since because again, this is the namespace thing. Oh, I don't need to do that. That's a lie. No, it's not. <laughs> oh, because I'm doing it in parallel. because of the executing, yeah. So PX magic, and then I'm getting plots. And these plots are actually being computed on the engines, and then because of the same message spec, remember in the notebook, the message spec is the kernel computes a plot and then sends that plot as, you know, this is MIME type image PNG, sends it to the notebook. Instead of having a notebook on one side, I have this uh, IPython client object, and it's getting the same message. Here is, a, here is an output its PNG data is this, and then the IPython client creates a wrapper of that whose PNG representation is the PNG representation of the, the message it got. And these are just the stock performance since 2011. I can create async map results. The async map results compute the same information, but it returns immediately, so I don't have my plots yet. So async results have this display outputs function, which says, all right, when I'm done, now that I'm ready, let me actually show you the nicely formatted output with plots and standard out and, and everything. What? There was an unpack line? Having startup files is bad, but super useful. Oh, it's level? Well, how about this? I'll do it everywhere. So px dash dash local means do it everywhere remotely, but also do it here. Then you don't even need to know where it was supposed to happen. It will do it in the right place. <laughs> So we've covered load balancing, we've covered multiplexing, um, and we've covered using them both at the same time. Yeah. Um, it might be a bit out of topic, but you've got these PNG plots. Um, yeah. Maybe not as much in you know, your browser works going on in the back of the box. It doesn't, it, it, does, it really doesn't matter. So it, it'll republish any, any display output. So if you're okay. using um, Vincent, which does JavaScript plots with Vega, You'll just, it'll just get a JavaScript output, and then it'll republish that just the same. It doesn't matter at all. Everything works. Let's get, where am I? All right. So Parallel Magic's adding IPython to IPython. Create our client. We've got PX for execute. When you call PX, you get print statements, you get, uh, Output caching, imports, I can print to standard error, and you get it a little bit of color. You can configure the, the behavior, the default behavior of PX. So now when I do this, 
I get an async result object. So if you if you want to use px, but you still want it to be async, um, then you can uh, get the the result back with px result, which is just disp wait for the result and then get it back. We can plot as we just saw. Scatter IDs. This will happen a lot. Uh, the, and the stride. So now everybody's got an ID and a stride. The strides are the same. The IDs are different. So now this is some. Everybody do the same thing, but your state means you'll actually do something different. So just plot some sign function. That was async, so I didn't get anything. I can do px result to get the result, and I get print statements from each engine. I've got plots. So engine zero got plot zero, et cetera. Exceptions. Uh, I get the uh, IPython will re render the, the multiple exceptions. So if everybody gets an error, you'll see, you'll see the exception for everybody who actually failed, just like you do in normal IPython. And remember, since the remote environment is IPython, cell ma I can use the PX cell magic to call cell magics in the remote IPython. Uh, let's do. Get back to synchronous. So I just did with the PX magic, all right, all my engines do this, but what this is, is with the bash cell magic, actually run this script in a, sub, in a bash subprocess. So we've got remote parallel interactive bash. Um, so for folks who don't know what cell magics are, cell magics are a, a way to pass the, the rest of the line, and if there is anything, and then the content of the cell is just as text to a function. And so with the PX magic, that passes the, the whole block to uh, view.execute. The bash cell magic uh, spawns, a, starts a subprocess and you know, runs bash with that text. Um, so the only way you can stack them is if one of the cell magics does execute, results in I sending code to IPython again. There are a couple of cell magics that do that. Um, I think it might work with time. Depends on how time works. Um, <coughs> But yeah, the, the, only, the only reason, so it doesn't work in general, because the, the function that uh, percent percent bash corresponds to will just get the big block of text. So if I put percent percent uh, Perl in here, basically I'm sending this percent percent Perl to bash, which doesn't understand it. And it'll, uh, I, th I don't think that does anything. Like I th <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think. <laughs> I guess bash just, oh, ah, yeah. I tried to foreground a, a, a job in bash. So, you know, that didn't do anything because there weren't any background jobs. Yeah, so parallel Ruby. I can scatter rank. I can, again, oh, so this is, this is another one stacking. So using the time it cell magic to time a, uh, a block of code, and I used rank so that each engine actually created an array of a different size. And then I used time it to time computing the norm on that on that array. And the uh, useful thing here is so you know, time it does automatic detection of how how many iterations it should do in order to get a reasonable number, um, and because each engine is an individual IPython instance, it's doing all that logic separately. I'm just running the same code, but with a different value for rank on all my engines. And so now I get the, um, I get timing information for different jobs. Yeah. Uh, that's the view.activate method. So if I did uh, even equals, and I do even.activate, I only get two results. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. And then activate takes an argument that's a suffix. So you can actually have multiple of these magics at a time. So if you do, if I did activate um, even, I would have px even. Yeah. So you can have. Can't really think of a really realistic use case where you want more than one, but it it works. Maybe you want two, like engine zero, and you want one for root and one for everywhere. That that actually makes sense. So debugging. Remember, uh, long ago, talked about how an IPython engine is just an IPython kernel, with the one difference that it connects instead of binds. Another bit of magic about zero MQ is you can have one socket both bind and connect at the same time. So there's this function called bind kernel, which just turns the IPython engine into a regular IPython kernel. And regular IPython kernels can actually have multiple front ends connected to them. So now everywhere, all my kernels are not just connected to the connected to the controller, they're also listening um, on their own ports. So I can run a bit of code everywhere. It raised an exception, as expected. Now I can everywhere run the magic Qt console. Now I have a Qt console. So let's do, let's, just to make sure we know what's going on. Show the PID everywhere. So, and then now I have a Qt console somewhere. So this is actually one of my engines. And it doesn't seem to work. Here's my backtrace. Exit. So now I've got the percent debug, interactive debugging session in one of my remote parallel engines. Right? So I've got, I started an engine connected to it and then I raised an exception, and then I opened a Qt console on that engine, and then in that Qt console I opened a debugging session. But you're skipping a step. The, the remote engine has to be able to launch uh, Qt console backbinder. Yes, so you can, that, well, that, that's only for the Qt console magic. Yeah. Um, you can, so if I did connect info, this is what you need, the information you need to connect to this kernel. So let's see if I open, do, 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 do. So I need this. So here I'm in a terminal. Console, is that big enough to read? Uh, oh, that doesn't work, never mind. Um, right, so now I've got a terminal session that's connected. And I can, and these things with existing can use SSH tunnels and all kinds of stuff to actually connect. So I could, this, my engine could be on a cluster, and if I can get to that cluster in some way, yeah. um, which is not, not in com on real compute clusters, is not always easy, yeah. um, but if I can get to it at all, um, then I can get an IPython session hooked up to it. Yeah? And in those environments, it may be that the QT console is <coughs> Well, if you can if you can open SSH tunnels to it, sure. the QT console will work. Well, that's yeah. Yeah, that's that's it's an awful, it's an awful discussion. You're right. Most yeah. of this should work. It's it's sort of worth for the ticket, right? Yeah. Somebody makes it happen. But yeah, yeah. You have to have bind, kernel. bind kernel is the important part. Yes. Yes, the Magic QT console was just a shortcut for um, IPython QT console. It's just, uh, it was just a shortcut for that. Mm, it was a shortcut for that. <laughs> well, yeah. I thought I was going to do okay because I wasn't going to paste enter, but it pasted enter. Um, yeah. All right. So we got debugging. We got, since it is IPython, you can do everything you can do with IPython. Connect multiple front ends to it. You can debug it. You get nice tracebacks. So why don't we take a second short break, and then I'll get into some more. Yeah. Can you? Uh, 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 yeah.
that? That's just because it populate. It doesn't actually ask the kernel what the prompt number is for the first prompt. It's a, it's a laziness in the, IPython console front end. It do, it just draws it draws one and doesn't ask until the second time. It could ask. It just doesn't bother. Great. So let's let's take a another I don't know five minute break. I'll come back at when that clock says three fifty. I think no, three fifty five. <laughs>